Coming up, we continue our Res 2023 coverage, this time with Freddie Bitsui, a Navajo chef and anthropologist. Plus, one of Wisconsin's most influential indigenous leaders talks education. And longtime political advocate Dick Trudell shares a little optimism on what could be around the corner for Native communities. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today with what appears to be a conclusion to a years-long legal battle against an indigenous environmental organization. A Minnesota jury is ordering Honor the Earth to pay $750,000 as a result of a sexual harassment lawsuit. The jury found that former employee Molly Campbell was sexually harassed and that she endured mental suffering and retaliation after she reported the allegations to leaders at the organization. The case stems from interactions that happened about nine years ago between Campbell and her former co-worker Michael Dahl. On several occasions in 2014, Dahl made sexual remarks and gestures towards Campbell, in some instances in front of other people, according to the lawsuit. Campbell was placed on unpaid administrative leave for speaking about the interactions with others. One of the key players involved was longtime environmental activist Winona LaDuke, who was dismissed about Campbell's complaints. Four days after the verdict, LaDuke said she was stepping down as executive director of the organization. In her transition letter, she apologized for not responding to the claims with, quote, the appropriate care and urgency. Crystal Tubles, who is executive co-director, is now assuming the vacancy, saying Honor the Earth is committed to the listening, healing, and intentional work ahead. ICT has reached out to all involved for a comment and has not heard back as of this recording. Anytime you gather large groups of Native people, sovereignty always seems to be a topic of conversation. ICT's Mackenzie Allen Charmley asked attendees at the leading conference for economic development in Las Vegas about it. Take a look. What is tribal sovereignty? Thousands are gathered here at Res, hoping to empower for generations. What exactly does tribal sovereignty mean? Well, it, it, it's, that's a good question. There's a lot of answers. Tribal sovereignty to me is the ability for our communities to live out the way that we were meant to live out, the way that our ancestors fought for us to be here. And that is to have that sovereignty of ourselves, the sovereignty of our people, that self-governance piece. For some, it's about recognition on a large scale. Having the ability to just do business with the government and I don't have to have a permission every time I go into a business deal. Tribal sovereignty, to me, it's, it's so important. It's the ability of of, uh, of tribes and you know Indian people to be able to you know make their own laws and to exercise you know our own you know flex our own laws you know we as Indian tribes we we pre-existed the United States and so I think it's so important that we you know we understand we are not parties to the Constitution because we were you know for others it's about tradition Tribal sovereignty to me means that I have a responsibility to my ancestors to do better in the current communities and climates that we're living in. And so for me to operate in this typical non-native space is to enforce my voice and really express the trides and tribulations that our people have been through. To live 
our own way, our own lives without any interference from churches or state governments or federal governments or anyone trying to push agendas or edu different educations that go against our connection to the earth, the waters, the, the natural way of life. Almost all we spoke to here say tribal sovereignty is about uplifting and supporting each other. To me, tribal sovereignty means that we take care of our own. We're, I think, writing history right, right now about what tribal sovereignty can look like in contemporary times and what tribes are capable of uh, when we are the authors of our own narrative. In Las Vegas, Nevada, on the homelands of the Southern Paiute people, Mackenzie Allen Charmley, ICT News. Well, the rare portrait of Lakota leader Sitting Bull was purchased at auction last month. The portrait is one of four known to have been painted by activist and artist Caroline Weldon. One is held at the North Dakota Historical Society in Bismarck, another at the Historic Arkansas Museum in Little Rock. This painting is the only one known to still be in private hands. The value of the 1890 piece was based on its subject matter and its dramatic history rather than the popularity of the artist. Blackwell Auctions opened the sale at $20,000. And get this, the winning bid was reached in about two minutes at the tune of $67,100. The person who bought the portrait was labeled as private and was from the Northeastern United States. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Nicole Soulier has worked in higher education for nearly 15 years. Her work ranges from curriculum to community development and overall aims to help underserved communities receive access to education. Nicole joins us now virtually to talk about her role at Madison College and her recent recognition as an influential leader in Wisconsin. Hello to you, Nicole. Bonjour. Nicole is my colleague, and I'm my name is Nicole. I just introduced myself, letting you know my name. I'm from Bad River, Wisconsin, and I'm Bear Clan. And it's an honor and pleasure to be here with you today. You have been named one of Wisconsin's most influential Indigenous leaders. What does that mean to you? This recognition honestly came as a surprise, and I didn't know about it until it was published. Um, I'm not sure of the process for individuals who are named to receive this recognition, but I'm humbled. And I was selected to be honored to be able to represent my family and my community in this way, um, those communities being my tribal community, my workplace, and my alma mater. So being recognized as an influential leader makes me think about all of those who have influenced my own life and those who have supported and guided me along the way. And I wouldn't be in a position I am today if it wasn't for my family, my teachers, my mentors, my friends who support me and support my work. And really this recognition gives me the opportunity to emphasize that we don't do this work alone. And it's important to recognize those who've come before me and to help maintain that path of my work. You are the Director of College Access and Experience Programs at Madison College. What exactly does the work uh, look like that you do? So my position at Madison College is somewhat new. I've been in this position for just two short months now. Prior to this, I uh, was a community engagement coordinator uh, that focused specifically on increasing our college's relationship with tribal and native communities in our district. And in that role, I was working both internally and externally at the college to help build pathways and the relationships that are necessary for our native students and our native communities to succeed. Uh, my role as director of college access and experience program is really an expansion of that and it allows me to further tap into my networks and experience to increase the success of our communities and our students. Um, some of the programs under my leadership include a Scholars of Promise program. So like many other Promise programs across the country, uh, we provide financial assistance to students above and beyond what they already receive from federal student aid to be able to pursue their education. Uh, we focus specifically on high school students, um, but we're going to work on expanding that soon. Um, and additionally, we uh, operate a Men of Excellence program, which provides support services for minoritized men in higher education, more specifically our Black, Latino, Hmong, and Native men. And it's dedicated to helping um, those individuals be retained in college and earn their credentials and reach their goals. 
I also oversee a first year experience program, which is a new initiative that looks at a broader set of incoming students who are entering college. Um, and then uh, one stop services, which is basically the frontline staff who are there for our students coming to campus looking for answers uh, for their questions about college. Um, other roles, I'm an advisor to the Native American Student Association, and I'm also the president of Choeja, um, which is a Native and Indigenous alumni affinity group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, through this work, I'm able to serve as a mentor to other students and help ensure that our students have the individualized support that they need. We only have about a minute left here, but I'm really curious, Nicole, what inspired you to work in this field to begin with? Um, so I just sort of landed here. Um, when I graduated with my undergrad degree, I went to an event where they asked me to speak about what my plans were and I didn't have any. So I made a joke and said, if anyone out there has a job for me, um, here's my information. And they contacted me and they said, I think I have something for you. Um, it was the event that where the where the event was being held. And so um, that's really how I got into it. But the what inspires me the most is my own experience coming through college and having the support of those advisors and mentors and people working within the system to be able to help our students. Well, Nicole Soulier, one of uh, Wisconsin's most influential Native leaders of 2023, thank you so much. Thank you. Miigwech. Navajo chef and anthropologist Freddie Bitsui was among the attendees at Res 2023 in Las Vegas. ICT Shirley Snavy has this interview with him about what classifies as traditional or authentic Native foods. Well, we've got a treat for you today, a culinary treat actually. Uh, we've got Freddie Bitsui here with us. He's one of the Native chefs that's here at the Res Conference. So welcome to the ICT newscast. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, I think you're most known for your uh, Smithsonian work. So what inspired you to uh, be a chef? Understanding the historical context of how Native people ate. I originally had majored in anthropology at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I believed that there were people in prehistoric lives that who, who we deem as our ancestors. You know, I view them as human not just some type of um, story or people were, I viewed them as human. There was lazy people, there were hungry people, they were gossipers. There, everything that we do today as far as our emotion, it was still pretty much I think was, was intact back then. So there had to be, have been two people who cooked and said, you know, I cook better than you. And that notion I think um, has always been a part of human um, societal evolution and by the time 2009 came around, I started my own consulting company, which I went to rural casinos, and then I would train people how to cut their food costs, um, be better cooks. Because unfortunately, in, in the food world, nobody says I want to go to rural Minnesota and be a chef. Everybody wants to go to New York or people want to go to California and be a chef. So I thought that if I could do these consulting um, gigs, it, it would empower the, the culinarians in, 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 in their respective commun um, communities and casinos. And it worked. It, it was a really good, it was a really good gig. And then I started um, getting involved with um, my own casino and I became the executive chef for uh, the casino that's in Gallup. And I, I was only there for a year and that's when Washington called. And apparently I had built my name so big from 2009 to 2015 that they called me for the job. Like I wasn't even looking for the job. They just said, hey, you wanna be the chef here? Which inadvertently was my dream job. So I, I didn't even have to think. And I managed to, uh, it may not be a, be a big move for non-culinarians or non-anthropologists, non but what I did was I managed to get rid of the words traditional and authentic because the museum when we put something out that was authentic, we, we, I've always got into little scuffles with people and they would say, wait, my grandmother didn't make it like this, so it's not authentic. It opened my eyes to the e enormity of uh, the culinary culture in with different tribes and with different peoples throughout um, North America and Mexico. So that's where all my studies came from. And I, I, you know, I continued to study working there and um, 
it managed to open my eyes so much broader to the whole Native America food spectrum. And that's what, what inadvertently came out of my book, which is called New Native Kitchen, you know, which you can get on Amazon. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's kind of where everything's at now. And um, I'm collaborating with a lot more chefs now. That's why I'm here because Don Sherman has been presenting and I just been, um, we're, we're planning on things together in the future, hopefully. You've had an opportunity to work with tribes all over the country. I mean, wh what would be some of the things that you were surprised to learn about regional cuisine? I think one thing that I was surprised to learn is how much people um, tend to think traditional food is when it's really like a post reservation. And I, uh, uh, like for example, I, I don't, I don't, I believe that there's no point in putting any food down, but like there's a lot of spam involved, and they call it traditional food, which is is fine, which which it 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 it's fine because it's been part of someone's emotion, it's been part of someone's you know walk in life and their families, and everything in, in that capacity. But prior to, um, uh, uh, when all the tribes were relocated. And how, like for example, I the example I use is the Delaware tribe was obviously living in the Delaware area because there's no Delaware in Oklahoma, right? So just imagine when you have abundance of food from the, the seas, the water, the bays, um, the woodlands, and then you're transferred to another place where there's absolutely nothing, so you have to adapt. Cooking with oil was, was, was not um, in our culture. And what I mean by that is putting oil in a, on a pan and letting it get hot and then hearing that sizzle. Now we did put fat in food, like um, wild boar, a lard, into cornmeal. That's how we make tamales. So when, when we use those processes, yeah, we're cooking with oil or fat, but it's a different type of technique. So even as minute, small techniques as these cooking processes are, it just changes it completely. And that's exactly what happened. And um, trying to revitalize and talk about the history is one thing, but trying to convince grandma is a whole different task. So that, that's where I think a lot of the Native American and, and, and uh, indigenous chefs are right now, just trying to convince um, people who are, have their heels dug in to not change. Is, is, is quite a, a, a task. The younger people are more a, a, a adapting to it. I, I, I'm very surprised about that. Well, Freddie Batsui, it's been just wonderful to meet you. Well, thank so you, thank you very me. much. It's, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Dick Trudell has a long and storied career working to improve the lives of Native Americans. In 1973, he founded the first of its kind American Indian Lawyer Training Program. Since then, he has watched the ranks of Native lawyers swell from a mere handful to thousands today. He also played a major role in convening tribal leadership forums over the decades. ICT's Stuart Huntington sat down with Trudell recently at his home in the San Francisco Bay Area. He asked if Trudell saw a particular opportunity for progress. I think that, you know, there has to be you know, more conversations in an intergovernmental way with states and local governments. I mean, you have, they have a shared future. And so they've got to find a, a way to uh, work together and you know, work out their differences. I mean, so they can kind of come up with, you know, mutually beneficial solutions to a problem that affects both. Um, it's been a, a struggle to, you know, get uh, state governments in particular to really um, respect tribal governments. Uh, and unfortunately, so many of them don't know much about the history, won't take time to understand the history. Uh, but, you know, tribes are real governments and, uh, you know, their, their sovereignty means a lot to them. Uh, but anyway, so that area, you know, just uh, the, the concern about intergovernmental intergovernmental relations going forward it has to be stronger, a better foundation for it. And it's like uh, agreeing to, to disagree, but to work out your differences. Sir, is there something that uh, you have seen in your career that gives you hope? Yes. When, uh, you know, I decided to go to law school and got my law degree and you know, and it had to decide what am I going to do next. Uh, they were just a small handful of tribal or Indian attorneys 
fast forward today, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's somewhere between three and 4,000. So I have hope that, and I'm optimistic, we have many more, you know, young Native professionals in different disciplines, you know, in medical, business, law, uh, you know, academics, you know, education, what have you. So that gives me hope uh, that, you know, they'll respond to the challenges they face. Uh, sir, you mentioned that, the, uh, that you thought the Biden administration was doing a good job. Uh, the Biden administration, I think, has really gone out of its way to make sure that tribes have a seat at the table. Uh, and I think really starting with uh, a cabinet member, uh, Deb Holland, and uh, they've made some just judicial appointments, which we've really had, haven't had before. There's beginning to be a few uh, Indians serving uh, as judges in, in different district courts across the country. Um, the one area we haven't probably seen is much activity uh, that I would like to see is the Department of Justice, uh, because you've got the FBI, you've, you've got you know other law-related entities, and I don't quite see uh, you know Indian involvement um, the way uh, we should be represented. U.S. Marshals, FBI, you know the different agencies within Department of Justice, U.S. Attorneys. Um, and hopefully that's coming. Uh, but again, it really turns sometimes on who you know in, in politics or politics. And, uh, but the Biden administration has done better than anybody. I mean, and uh, you know, I, I used to think that you know, the Clinton administration started to do a few things, but they didn't go as far as, uh, you know, as Biden and, and Obama as well. I mean, Obama did some good things, but uh, uh, you know, Biden has exceeded uh, what they've done uh, financially and in terms of political appointees. Sir, I want to ask you, do you have a, a message? Let's say that there's a senior at Haskell right now. Do you have a message for her, sir? Uh, my word would be to any a young person is, uh, you know, expose yourself to as much as you can because you never know what you really want to do until you've, you know, you've kind of uh, uh, seen things that, uh, that may attract you or may attract your interests. Um, you know, and we have many more kids in college, and, and even with the, the tribes that have the community colleges, you know, so education is, is critical, and uh, we have a ways to go, but we've come a long ways just in the past, you know, 40 years or so, you know. So I remain optimistic, and uh, all it takes is one or two, three people to make a big difference um, uh, in any given area, and so uh, I, I think we're, we're at a good, at a good place. Uh, we have a long ways to go, and obviously uh, future generations are going to experience different challenges. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, sir? I think one of the things that I experienced and, and witnessed was that I think periodically Indian country needs to kind of uh, take stock of itself. And, and what I mean by that is in the 1970s, they, there was the American Indian Policy Review Commission. It was uh, established by Congress and mandated to provide a report, uh, you know, after I think its life was two years, uh, and the report came uh, shortly after it had completed its two-year uh, 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 life, so to speak. I think Indian country kind of needs to do something similar to that. They have the resources to do it on their own but to take stock of where they're at you know, from a policy standpoint, what needs to be done. Um, and it doesn't have to be exhaustive, but I think that uh, effort should, should happen. I mean, uh, I had the benefit of, of participating and, and witnessing a lot of national meetings where tribal leaders were coming together and were more unified. And, and because of that, sometimes spoke with one voice as, as opposed to politicians just hearing a babble from Indian country. We need this, we need that, we don't like this, we don't like that, what have you. But I think if uh, uh, people can come together uh, and you know, take stock of where they're at and what some of the uh, priorities are going forward, uh, not in an exhaustive way, but certainly uh, you know, looking at you know, topics that need to be addressed or shored up or what have you, and that's not being done right now. Um, there isn't the uh, amount of unity that I would like to see in Indian country uh, that I witnessed in the, the 70s, the 80s, uh, even the 90s, and we don't seem to come together unless there's a crisis. 
Um, but I think there needs to be more, you know, kind of coming together and uh, something that I always enjoyed being a part of. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you never know what's going to bubble up. I mean, some real progress can happen, uh, as well as to be educated about each other's issues and priorities and, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, when and where they can collaborate uh, to make a difference. So, uh, collectively, if they were together, they could be a real force economically, uh, not only because of gaming, but some of the other thing, economic things that some of the tribes are doing. Um, Anyway, I have hope that uh, the, the generations that come will, will do all right. There'll be challenges, you know, but uh, they're better prepared than we've ever been in terms of uh, younger people who've gone off to college and, you know, have degrees and, you know, what have you. So uh, uh, time will tell. Uh, thank you very much, sir, okay. for sitting with us. Okay. My, my pleasure. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.